Welcome back to the fourth video about the details of digital compasses, specifically the QMC5883L. In the last video, we talked a lot about the need for calibration and the theory of calibration. And I showed you two calibration methods and we actually implemented a simpler one. Uh, the results were a little bit underwhelming, but anyway, we continued by calculating from the sensor data actually a compass direction. Card here, link in the description. Since the results of the scaled biases method of calibration or how I like to call it min-max method because it really only takes the minimum and maximum values for each axis into account, we will start out this time by implementing the full Mounty here, the correction matrix. In the previous video, I kind of dismissed the correction metric method because first, that correction matrix is hard to calculate. You usually do that on a PC, not on a microcontroller. And second, that was really the no-go. The calibration procedure itself requires some precision. If you want to know the details of that method, watch the previous video again. I already carded it, link in the description. Meanwhile, I found a free Windows software for calculating that correction matrix. And the best thing about that software is it doesn't require precision measurements to be taken with your sensor. It just requires that you take lots of measurements with your sensor and that's doable. So we will first collect a whole lot of raw data from our sensor and then we will calculate the correction matrix and biases using that Windows program. And finally, we will implement the correction matrix calibration in our Arduino code. How to collect the data? The goal is here to take raw data readings from as many orientations as possible. And people who take that seriously have some kind of three axis cadenic jig where they can put the sensor in and rotate it freely around all axes. I, for my part, will be using just a little Lego jig here. <laughs> So I will do a total of 14 full 360 degree rotations here in obviously 14 different orientations. The first six rotations will be around the three major axes I have here. But to get to actually six rotations, I will do two rotations for each major axis, mainly in a uh, yeah, kind of up position and in a down position. The next four rotations will happen here on the jig at a 45 degree angle with the USB connector pointing upwards. And this is the first basic orientation, that's the second basic orientation. And then I have two more when I flip those over. The last four rotations are exactly the same, but for the fact that the USB connector is pointing downwards. You might be wondering why we only need four rotations at a 45 degree angle and not six. And the answer is symmetries. For example, look at that position here. Looks like something new. Yeah, the short edge of the board on my slope. However, if I rotate that a little bit here, yeah, we already did that. If you visualize that in 3D, and I'm using an old light bulb here for that purpose, the, the blue lines here on the, uh, well, globe, these were the rotations around our three major axes. And the red lines here are two or at least four more rotations. Yeah, each line counts double because we have an up and down. And the green lines here are the final four rotations at a 45 degree angle. So we covered our globe quite good. I will now collect the data and I'm using here the version 6 of the code. Uh, the only two changes here are I'm using now here a plot data for the raw axis which just prints the raw data from the axis on the serial port with tabs in between. And I will capture that in the Arduino serial monitor.
Now I'm just copying here all the data from the serial monitor into a text file. Before we can actually use that Windows software to calculate our correction metrics from the calibration data we collected, we have to do some more math. The software requires you to enter the strength of the earth magnetic field in the units you measured it. So, the earth magnetic field here in Central Europe is about 48 microteslas and the QMC 5883L gives you 3000 least significant bits per gauss in the 8 gauss range. And 1 gauss is 100 microteslas, so 48 microteslas are 0.48 gauss. And these 0.48 gauss are of course 1440 least significant bits. So we have to enter 1440 in our software. So just as a sanity check, I looked into the data file to see if there are any values in there, absolute values, so disregarding the sign, that are significantly larger than the 1440 we just calculated. And I'm talking here order of magnitude larger or factor two larger, but uh, that's not the case. The largest values are about 1800 absolute, so uh, we're golden. So, and here's the Windows software, Magneto 1.2. It's really just an exe that you start. You don't need to install anything. I put a download link and links to a blog about it in the description of the video. I've entered here my 1440 at the norm of magnetic or gravitational field. Obviously, you can use the same software to calibrate your three axis accelerometers, but that's another story. I selected here my data file and now I click calibrate. And yeah, that's here our calibration data and it already gives you here the formula how to calculate the calibrated stuff. We already seen that. But here's a short recap anyway. And I won't explain again the matrix multiplication and subtraction stuff. For that, please watch the previous video again. So we take our raw data XYZ and we subtract the biases XYZ and then we multiply the result with the correction matrix A to I and that gives us our calibrated values XYZ. The reason I'm revisiting all the stuff is that I also explained in the last video that if you set the BCF and DGH values in your matrix to zero and just take here the values on the diagonal AEI, you end up with that. And that's basically the correction formula of our scaled biases method, which I explained also back then, misses of course these slight nuances here. Anyway, we would expect that our Magneto 1.2 will give us a correction matrix with values here in the diagonal near 1, yeah, approximating the, or the first approximation of our scaled biases method, and then very small correction uh, factors here in the yellow area. And indeed, if we look at the Magneto 1.2 results, we see here at the diagonal in green all values are close to 1, while in the two yellow areas the values are all smaller than plus minus 0.1. That's a good first verification for your calibration results. Anyway, these combined biases here should be arranged top to bottom x, y, z so that we have our bias vector. And that's the code to make use of that calibration data. By the way, we are at version 7. In our header file, we have to change the struct calibration to contain that bias vector of three values and that scale matrix of three by three, so a total of nine values. The recall calibration method no longer exists and I've deleted all calls of it in the code because we do the calculation of the calibration data now in an external Windows program. We also no longer need the biases and scales arrays because the equivalent data is now contained in our calibration struct. 
In the C++ file, I rewrote the reset calibration method. It still goes over all the axes and sets the bias for each axis to zero. So we add nothing to our raw values. And then it goes through every cell in our matrix and sets the values in the diagonal to one and all other val uh, values to zero. If you multiply our raw values with that matrix, you again get our raw values. So that really resets the calibration to something that doesn't change our raw values. I also changed the calibrated data access function to, well, do the math now for our new calibration method. That's all in the C++ file. In the sketch itself, I obviously pass our calibration data from Magneto 1.2 to our set calibration method. And then, like in the previous video, I plot the calibrated data here in a format for the Arduino serial plotter. And the result, and I'm showing here calibrated data. Let's rotate here. And we have our sign signal. Let's see. Ooh, that looks so much better. Yeah, same amplitude, exactly the same amplitude. That looks so much better than the other calibration method, doesn't it? Um, but does it work in 3D? I mean, that's where the uh, scaled <laughs> biases method totally failed. Uh, Lego jig. So now we should see two sine waves again, but on two other channels from two other sensors. And here they come. Beautiful. Uh, yeah, we have one axis left, I think. Let's try that too. Very nice. Same amplitude. Same zero line. That's what I wanted to see. But now let's have a look at the azimuth we can calculate from that. And I just uncommented that line and commented the calibrated data plotting line. So I still have from the last video my north here. And if we align our board, we are at 356, 55. So yeah, also five degrees off, well, maybe a little bit less, but that was the same result with the uh, uh, faked calibration last time. And this calibration works in 3D. Now let's try and turn here to east. Yeah, that works. Not too much noise still on the signal, but yeah. We're pointing to east, 90 degrees. Now we are pointing to south. And we're almost spot on. Oh, oh, we were 180 degrees. Nice. And let's try west. So yeah, 260, sometimes 65. Not too shabby. Um, still missing a little bit of precision here, but I guess we will have to implement some low pass filter for our data. But uh, that's something for another day. Instead, let's try to get rid of these nasty I squared C errors we encountered in the second video. Card here, link in the description, real quick or not. To analyze these errors a little bit further, I changed the code in the sketch. So in the setup, I'm again printing out each and every error I'm encountering and no longer setting that error flag for the loop. 
in the loop I have now three static counters all initialized to zero of course. The first one just counts the read data calls I do, the second one the I squared seek errors I encounter and the third one the QMC errors I encounter. There's only one QMC error, the QMC data overflow. The next two lines are unchanged, yeah, just handling the interrupt stuff and if we have data I increment my reads counter and I execute a QMC 5883L read data and should that fail I check if my last error was indeed a QMC data overflow. In that case I increment my QMC error counter, otherwise I increment my I squared C error counter. And of course if we had an error I print out the error and in each loop I print out a nicely formatted statistic of the errors to the serial port. So let's have a look at the serial monitor then. So I waited a while until I had a nice big number of reads, so 15,000 now and you see we have 135 I2C errors, so about 0.8% of my reads uh, have an I2C error and 65 QMC, so out of range errors, about 0.4% and now I'm pulling the plug here and so data, I have no idea why you have data overflow errors. That shouldn't be the case because uh, yeah, it's just sitting here on my desk, no magnet nearby. And oh, there was another error. Data overflow again, okay. Data overflow, no, no, that can't be. Okay, I squared C request partial. I didn't get all the bytes I wanted. Request partial. Okay, I uh, put that in a editor and then we can just uh, search for the errors. Okay, I searched through the whole file. We have only these two types of error. Either it's an I squared C request partial or an QMC data overflow. Hmm. Okay, I actually solved that problem quite fast and I did that by varying three parameters. The first one being the wire clock speed. The datasheet states that this device supports standard and fast speed modes, 100 kilohertz and 400 kilohertz. But you never know, maybe the 400 kilohertz of my Nano Every are too fast for the chip. So yeah, I varied between both settings for the I2C speed. Needless to say, it wasn't the wire clock speed. So I went into my read registers method and I put a delay of two microseconds between my transmission stuff and my request stuff. Because the datasheet states that there has to be a minimum time of 1.3 microseconds between each transmission and maybe my Arduino Nano Every is too fast so there's not enough time between the transmission and the request from. In the end it turned out it was a missing stop signal here from the master in the first part of the I2C read sequence where I transmit the register address to the slave which I want to read from. So yeah, little bug here in the data sheet. I changed my code here in the read register method accordingly. So that's the old version where end transmission gets as a parameter false. So it doesn't release a bus and doesn't send a stop signal. And that's the new version here where end transmission gets as a parameter true. So it releases a bus and sends that stop signal. Now let's have a look at the serial monitor. I let that thing run for a while. We are now at 18,000 reads and not a single I squared C error. And the QMC data overflow errors are also gone. I never could explain them in the first place. My best guess is that was also an I squared C transmission error. So for some reason that data overflow bit got set in the data status register. But anyway, Everything's fine now. 
And on that positive note, I will leave you for today. I also have to make a confession. I already fixed that I2C bug in previous versions, but I wanted to show you how I went about fixing that bug. What could be the possible problems in I2C communication? Anyway, next time we tackle the nasty noise problem. I already prepared some stuff for that. Till then, bye.